Hello there, and welcome back to video four of Evolutionary Milestones in which life takes a hold on planet Earth. So everything up until this point that we've covered in the other videos has taken place during the Archean Eon. So this is a period of time in Earth history that lasted from about 4,000 to about 2,500 million years ago. Bear in mind that this has nothing to do with the group of organisms, the Archaea, um, which we met in the previous videos, except linguistically. So both the Archean Aeon and the uh, group of organisms are based on the ancient Greek word Archean, meaning ancient. So they've got a linguistic uh, root, but they don't share any of the scientific concepts in common. And in this video, we're going to talk about the first widespread fossils that we find on planet Earth. So shortly after those first very small cellular fossils that I introduced to you in the last video, stromatolites start appearing on Earth. Now stromatolites are structures that are generally associated with bacterial mats. I note at this point that some recent papers suggest that uh, stromatolites actually appear really quite early in Earth history. For example, there was a Nature paper in 2016 which suggested that there were 3.7 billion year old stromatolites. The reason that I um, don't really focus on those as evidence for life very early in life history is because when you get stromatolites this old, it's very difficult to prove that they're biogenic, so have a biological origin, as opposed to, for example, being a mineral crust. Um, what we can say is that many cyanobacteria, sorry, many stromatolites are caused when cyanobacteria trap layers of calcium carbonate as they grow upwards to get towards the light to allow photosynthesis. Uh, robustly uh, biogenic stromatolites, i.e. those that we are fairly confident are biological in origin, appear at about 3.4 billion years ago. And they are common by about 3 billion years ago, suggesting that about 3,000 million years uh, ago in Earth history, we had widespread bacterial colonization of the Earth. I've put some 3D models of stromatolites just below this video in the website for this uh, chunk of course content. Please do take some time to have a look at these and become a bit more familiar with what they look at with what they look like, partly because they're actually relatively common in the uh, rock record and you may well see them on field work, so it's really useful for you to have an idea of what these look like in rocks, but also because they're really cool. These are the earliest macroscopic evidence for life on Earth and I think that's really, really exciting, so definitely worth having a look at those 3D models. Stromatolites are found today in Shark Bay in Australia, for example, and I've, I've put some uh, images of modern day stromatolites here. But in modern ecosystems, stromatolites only really develop in environments that nothing else can survive in. So these are, for example, hypersaline, very salty environments or environments which are too hot, hot to host <clears throat> widespread forms of life other than uh, bacteria. That's because um, in modern ecosystems where other organisms can live, such as invertebrates, for example, uh, stromatolites can't develop because they are eaten by other organisms. But on early Earth, there weren't these other organisms to stop their development. Hence, they're very widespread for much of the um, big chunk of Earth history that comes after the origin of life and the, their first appearance on Earth. Now, before we go on to the next slide, I want you to have a quick think about whether there has always been free oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. So I'm going to leave you for 15 seconds or so to have a think about that question. So, what do you think? Is the answer yes? Or is the answer no? If your money was on yes, I'm afraid you're incorrect because the answer is actually no. Uh, oxygen, free oxygen, started building up in the Earth's atmosphere 
at some point during the Archaean. This gradual accumulation of oxygen culminated in a thing called the Great Oxygenation Event, or the GOE, which occurred um, around 2.5 to 2.4 billion years ago. What caused the GOE? I'm sure you're wondering. Well, this requires the evolution of photosynthesis of specifically the kind shown on this slide here. So this uses sunlight as an energy source to combine water and carbon dioxide uh, to create complex sugars. And these are the basis of many of the uh, uh, bits that plants build themselves out of. And of course, given the, uh, that the vast majority of ecosystems on Earth are based on organisms that eat plants or organisms that then eat those organisms, this is the basis of many of our ecosystems on Earth today. And it's plausible that photosynthesis uh, paralleled the development of stromatolites in this early Earth. It may well be that early photosynthesizers use sunlight in some form of different reaction to the one that I've just shown you, which releases, releases oxygen. But we can be sure that by the time the GOE really began about 2.5 billion years ago, uh, oxygen was accumulating uh, in the atmosphere and thus this form of photosynthesis had evolved. This is marked in the rock record by an increase in red, so that's oxidized soils, and the disappearance of minerals such as pyrite which are easily oxidized in any kind of widespread form in the rock record. This event is also associated with a large number of banded iron formations. I've shown you an image of one of these from um, northwestern Australia on this slide, which you can see here. And these result from the iron that was in the oceans up until this point, probably in a reduced form, being oxidized and thus settling out to form the banded iron formations. Cyanobacteria, um, so members of that um, group, the bacteria, were the first organisms to evolve photosynthesis that releases uh, O2 on the planet. And indeed, uh, things like plants not only came much later, they actually make use of cyanobacteria to do their photosynthesis for them. More on this later in our Zoom chat if you want to ask about it. Thus, cyanobacteria, or the ancestors of modern cyanobacteria at least, caused the great oxygenation event. There is some evidence that the origin of cyanobacteria may have occurred, occurred in a terrestrial, so a freshwater perhaps, environment, somewhere between 3.8 and 2.5 billion years ago. Yes, those are very big error bars, but them's the breaks when you're dealing with stuff this old. The exact timing and first appearance of free oxygen is still debated, as you can see from this diagram, which I borrowed from a 2014 paper by Lyon et al. in Nature. We have lots of uh, what we tend to refer to as whiffs or small localized examples of what may represent free oxygen on Earth. But current evidence favors uh, pre-GOE origins for oxygen in some form at least, how widespread this was we're not sure, and then a lag before the, the accumulation of free oxygen in the atmosphere. And this lag was due to buffering reactions that used up early oxygen, such as reaction with reduced hydrogen, carbon, sulfur, and iron in the Earth's early oceans. The appearance of oxygen on Earth at about 2.5 to 2.4 billion years ago marks the end of the Archean and the beginning of the Proterozoic Eon, which spans from 2.4 billion years to the appearance of animals at 541 million years ago. So fossil deposits of single-celled generally life are smattered throughout this time period. I wanted to give you one example. I've given you some examples of the fossils from this deposit on the slide that you can see on your screen in, all, in this video here. And this is the 1,878 million year old gunflint formation from Lake Superior in Canada. 
I've chosen this because it's a really cool and notable example of a Proterozoic ecosystem that is remarkably well preserved. It's used as a benchmark for Precambrian cellular preservation. It has a high number of individual microfossils and a big diversity, v diversity sorry, of form that is seen within these. It includes filamentous bacteria, such as the ones that you can see on my mouse is here. Those are called gonflintia, if you're interested. There are spherical bacteria, which you can see in the bottom middle here. So these are called huraniospora. There are star-shaped bacteria, shown on the bottom right here, called eostrion. And then there are structures of unknown affinity that are potentially really interesting, such as eosphera, that's shown on the top right here. So all of these are found in abundance in the gun flint chert. So that's what makes it a really exciting and important neoproterozoic fossil deposit. And that brings us to the end of this video. So I'll see you back for number five in a short while.